Thank you very much, uh, Valerio, and also Signatio for inviting me to be here. It's really a pleasure. I've enjoyed a lot uh, all the discussions I had so far, and it's really impressive to see all what you are doing. So today uh, I will talk about something that I want to show you first in a photo. Okay. So this is a photo that inspires very much uh, what we do, and to some extent is our or my obsession too. So it's I'm really obsessed. So so as you see here, uh, you see a little dot. And if you have not talked to us, and if you don't know what we are doing, I bet that most of you will think that this is just a single atom or a single ion, right? Because it looks like it. Yeah? We see the scattering light coming from something. But actually what we see here is not a single atom or a single ion, but it's actually a much, much bigger object. Actually, it's a silicon, uh, sorry, a silica glass nanoparticle. Okay, so this is really a piece of glass, like the glass we have in the window but has a size of around 100 nanometers. And that means that this, this is an object that has a mass of 10 to the nine atomic mass units. Okay, so it's quite a much more massive object, nine orders of magnitude more massive than a single atom. And what we see here is actually the scattered light coming from the laser light that is used to trap this particle in a vacuum chamber. Okay, and when, when, when we see a picture like that, there is something we already see, which is the position of this object, we see that this object is, it has this position, it's placed here. But as we know, in quantum mechanics, the position of an object is a concept that, that is uh, actually not so well defined, and actually the position of an object can be in a state that is delocalized, is in a superposition state. Sometimes we say the object is in two places at the same time, or so on. And this is something we have seen very nicely with atoms uh, and with other microscopic objects. The question of, of this talk is actually to ask ourselves what is the largest object that can be placed in a microscopic quantum superposition state, namely a state in which the position is really delocalized over scales comparable to the size of the object. And why is this interesting? Well, imagine that this object is so large that we can measure the gravitational field it generates. Okay. Then the question is, what is the gravitational field generated by a source mass that is not localized in space? From quantum mechanics, that's easy. But from the GR point of view, that's actually not easy at all. And would be very interesting that this can be observed experimentally. OK, so my name is Uriel Romero Zart. So I, I'm a theorist that I've been working on these systems for yeah, many years now and in close collaboration with experimental groups. And actually, the question of this talk is something we want to address now experimentally in close collaboration with the groups of uh, Marcus Aspelmeyer in Vienna, Lucas Novoni, and Romain Kidan at ETH Zurich. And we got this grant to just try to prepare a massive object into a microscopic superposition. And if you look at the mass scale from all the experiments done in the history, so of course they were the first matter wave interferometry experiments with electrons, with neutrons, alkali atoms, fuller N. The world record now is these amazing experiments done in the group of Marcus Arn, where they show matter wave interference with organic molecules, which have a mass of around 10 to the four atomic mass units. And now we want to make this jump to try to do the same with much bigger particles. Okay, so nanoparticles which have a mass scale of around 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12. And this is a, a project that got funded by the European Research Council and that we are pursuing for the next years. And uh, in this talk, I basically want to tell you three things. Okay, so the first one is uh, the progress that has been done in controlling the motion of these glass nanoparticles. Uh, the second one is, of course, to talk about decoherence, because in the context of thinking about observing quantum phenomena large scales, decoherence is very, very relevant. We all know that the Schrodinger cat state superposition, if you have an infrared camera, you know whether the cat is dead or alive. So, you know, so one has to account about the infrared radiation emitted by the cat in order to talk about the Schrodinger cat superposition. And last but not least, Based on this control that we learn on, on these particles and also the understanding of the coherence, then I will show you a, pro a very recent proposal that we believe it's experimentally feasible to do prepare these microscopic quantum superposition states. Okay, so let's start with the first, with the control. So um, uh, what is important is that now in this field, uh, as I said before, an optical uh, a trap 
particle can be levitated, can be loaded and levitated in high vacuum, and that's a very well-known technique. One needs to use an optical tweezer, namely to focus a laser beam, uh, such that then the electric particle, which is a polarizable object, gets attracted to the maximum of intensity. Yeah, and uh, you have these similar experiments with, with Redger atoms, for instance, in the lab of, of Huan Chan. Uh, but here we want to do this with glass nanoparticles, which actually is the first thing that was done by the work of Ashkin. Ashkin developed how to trap particles and cool particles using laser light doing experiments with levitated microparticles back in the 70s. So we are actually doing the same uh, many years after. Uh, the, the, the nice thing, however, is that once this particle is trapped, it basically feels an harmonic potential, okay? And what is good to remember is that we all know from basic quantum mechanics that you have an harmonic potential, then you have eigenstates. And what is important to know is that the ground state has a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian state and has a width, a length scale that is given by the following parameters. It's just given by the radius of the particle, 100 nanometers, which defines the mass given the density of silica. That's around 10 to the 10 atomic mass units. And the typical trap frequency is around 10 to the 5 uh, uh, hertz. And when you look at the typical length scale that appears in the, in the harmonic oscillator, the square root of h bar divided 2 times the mass and the trap frequency, for these big masses, this is a very tiny scale, 10 to the minus 12 meters. Okay? In temperature, this corresponds to a center of mass temperature of microkelvins. And now, experimentally, only recent, uh, two or three years ago, they were able to really cool down the center of mass motion of this glass nanoparticle to the quantum regime, okay, to this, to, to this extremely low level of, fluc of center of mass fluctuations. And this actually is very, very uh, spectacular because of the following reason. So if you think now the particle has a center of mass that is really localized to such a tiny scale, even a scale is smaller than the size of an atom. But actually, the particle is pretty hot because it absorbs laser light and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually it heats up. Okay? And actually, in experiments, at least the particle is at 300 kelvins and probably even more. That means that you have an object that if you would touch it, it would feel very hot. Okay? But its center of mass is really cold. Okay? So, and, and this is actually pretty amazing because the center of mass is nine orders of magnitude uh, colder than the internal temperature of the object, okay? And they don't talk to each other, okay? And, and this, as I said, has been done experimentally. So there were these experiments in, in the last years where, uh, where basically a particle was levitated in vacuum and then either inside an optical cavity and then one would use uh, standard uh, sideband cooling in an optical cavity to remove all the center of mass thermal energy this was the first experiment done in the group of Marcus Aspermeyer. And then without cavities, by also measuring very precisely the position of the particle using the scattered light, people could, uh, the scientists could apply some feedback force using electro electric forces and then start to slow down the motion to the quantum regime, to this extremely small level. This was done also in the groups of uh, Marcus Aspermeyer, Lucas Novoni, and there are also uh, very uh, uh, recent experiments also by the group of Franco, uh, Francesco Marin in Italy and uh, Professor Aikawa in Japan. Okay, so this is now possible. So people can levitate nanoparticles and cool it to the quantum regime. So just for you to know, this is now a very active field. Uh, I think around the world there are more than 40 research groups doing uh, experiments on levitating of particles. And basically, just to give you a quick uh, summary of why is this interesting, there are these four areas of application. Uh, one is what we will talk here in this talk is about quantum science and testing quantum mechanics at large scales. But people are also very interested in studying the properties of these objects once they are so small and so isolated. For instance, there were experiments where they took a particle and they started to spin it up to gigahertz frequencies, which means the particle was doing one billion turns per second. And they could not spin it more because the centrifugal force was so strong that the particle exploded. Okay? And then people are interested in looking at the properties of these uh, nano uh, materials at this such uh, the, 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 at such high stress conditions. Also, there is a lot of interesting things in terms of non-equilibrium because you have these solid objects completely decoupled from the environment and very easily placed in out of equilibrium situations. And also for sensing, for sure, because these objects are massive, are, are, are very sensitive to external signals. You can use them as accelerometers, as force sensors, and so on. 
Okay, but today I want to talk about the part of fundamental quantum mechanics. And what is important is that in this field now, there is a lot of control. We know how to control the motion of these particles. Uh, this is, experimentalists are working on this since more than 10 years, and they are applying many techniques used in the field of AMO, of atomic, molecular, and optical physics. And for instance, things they can do is for sure you can, for instance, control the environment very well, so you can go from from having a particle moving in dissipative dynamics, because for instance, you have gas, but then you can slowly remove the gas and transition from conservative, from dissipative dynamics to conservative dynamics. You can control the environment, you can shine thermal light, you can do all type of things, of course. And the traps are very deep, so it's very easy to keep the particle trapped there. Uh, the second thing is that there are many degrees of freedom one could look at, the center of mass, which will be the topic of this talk, but there is also rotational degrees of freedom for objects that are not spherical, there are internal vibrations, internal acoustic phonons, and so on. Uh, of course, very similarly to the field of AMO, we can modify the potential very easily, as opposed to clamped optomechanical systems where you have an harmonic oscillator. Here we can just change the potential. We can have double wells and, and other inverted potentials and so on. Then there is the possibility to cool, to remove uh, center of mass entropy uh, by just doing active or passive feedback, as I said before. And while perhaps the most advanced experiments so far are with optical levitation, one can also do magnetic levitation of of objects that, that would absorb laser light. Uh, you can electrostatically levitate them, magnetically levitate them, and there are many groups uh, here, like, like uh, Tao Wang, for instance, did a lot of uh, work on magnetic levitation of, of ferromagnetic particles and superconducting particles. And last but not least, one can also consider to couple the motion of these particles to quantum systems, uh, like we do with atoms either with quantum systems that are near the particle or that they are inside. For instance, there are many experiments doing levitation of nanocrystal, nanodiamond with MBs and trying to couple uh, the center of mass motion to, to the spin, okay? But, uh, but this is just to show you that there is a lot of experimental control now on these particles. And now the goal that we have, what we want to do is how to use this control to delocalize the center of mass over large scales. And I want to emphasize this. So, as I said before, when we cool to the ground state, the center of mass is really localized to this minute uh, landscape. This is called the zero point motion landscape. And this is what is happening with all optomechanical systems and other nanomechanical systems. What we would like to do now is to really try to expand this wave function to land scales larger than the zero point motion. Okay, and the factor, uh, the figure of merit will be this parameter eta that tells me how much I delocalize over the zero point motion. And ideally, we would like to delocalize the particle over scales comparable to the radius so that we could imagine this glass particle really being delocalized over length scales comparable to the size. And please note the challenge. Uh, we are talking here, uh, these particles have 100 nanometers, so this means increasing the wave function by five orders of magnitude. Okay, so as you can imagine, this plot is not to scale. Five orders of magnitude is a lot. Okay. And we want to do that coherently. And if we do that coherently, uh, increasing the spatial delocalization of the wave function is equivalent to motional squeezing. Okay, so if we delocalize a wave function in a coherent way, it means we are squeezing it. Okay, and I want to emphasize this is important. As you know, in phase space, for instance, if you describe the state as a Bigner function, if you now expand or you increase the standard deviation of, of, for instance, x in a coherent way, the volume remains constant in phase space. Therefore, you need to squeeze the phase space probability distribution. Okay? And let me emphasize what that means. Okay? So for instance, when we are at the zero point motion scale, the amount of squeezing we have is zero. So the, the variance in units of zero point motion is of the same order. So there is zero squeezing. Zero decibels. If we would now, this, and we, we, we use this nomenclature, this would be a size XS, okay? So now let's increase the size. We increase by a factor of 10 the size of the wave function. This corresponds to motional squeezing invariance of the order of 20 decibels. And this for, for quantum experiments, 20 decibels of squeezing invariance starts to be significant. If we increase a factor of 10 in, in wave function, this is 40 decibels in motional squeezing, and so on. So for instance, when we say about increasing 
five orders of magnitude, this is really would be generating 100 decibels of motional squeezing. Okay, and this would be to go to these scales XXL. So that's actually the ambitious goal. We would like to do quantum mechanics at the at the XXL size. Okay, and um, and and this is also it also shows that this for sure is going to be challenging because it's very hard to squeeze any quantum system to such level. But uh, let's talk about it. So for sure, in that context, decoherence has to play a very important role. So how? How are you going to squeeze so much? How are you going to delocalize so much without, you know, in a realistic environment? And therefore, one needs to discuss the coherence very well. And this is something for sure we, we take a lot of care. And, uh, and here it's good to remember that in this context, when you have a particle interacting with the environment, the position will suffer decoherence because the environment, to some extent, measures the position or couples to the position. And this is a very well-known study. It's a very no, well-known thing in, in the theory of decoherence. For instance, there is this beautiful seminal paper by, by Jos and Zeh, where they actually looked into this, of how uh, the position of a particle decoheres due to uh, the coupling to the environment. Yeah? And what typically happens is, is it, what happens, the type of decoherence that the particle suffers is what is called position localization. So that means that the center of mass uh, state in position basis becomes diagonal. So all the off-diagonal terms in the position basis become uh, decay. And they decay expo uh, exponentially with a factor that depends on, on the distance of, on how far you are from the diagonal. Okay? And this has a very intuitive uh, reason. And actually, there are, let me just tell you, there are two regimes. There is a length scale here that determines that this rate grows with the distance from the diagonal until it saturates. And actually, the intuition is that uh, this length scale lambda is the de Broglie wavelength of the particle that collisions with your object. Okay? So, and, uh, and the other parameter tells you it has to do with the flux. Yeah? And, and, and basically, what happens is, for instance, if you have a, a, a collision where an object has such a small de Broglie, de Broglie wavelength that can resolve this length scale, then you, you already you only care about how many collisions you have per time. And this is so-called it provides the which path information. Whereas if any scattering event does not provide all the information about the position, about the two possible states, then you don't kill the state completely, but you start to decohere it slowly, and then you, you have this. Yeah? This is very well understood and is relevant to us. Okay, so for instance, just to give you an example for for the particles. The first thing is when we have a particle in an optical tweezer, of course, the photons of the tweezer scatter off. And if you don't measure them, these photons carry information about the position. And this is very well studied. This is called laser recall heating. It also happens with atoms and ions. So basically, what happens is that the laser photon scatters by increasing its energy or decreasing this energy, its energy because it either absorbs a phonon or emits a phonon. Yeah? And this happens randomly. And therefore, the particle starts to heat. And actually, this is the famous heating rate. So if you have a particle in an optical trap and you have a laser on, its center of mass energy, the number of phonons, grows linearly in time. And this gamma is the famous recoil heating rate that happens with ions, with atoms, and of course, with nanoparticles. And for instance, this is just a quick advertise. This is something we have analyzed very, very carefully in our group, is to develop a light matter uh, uh, quantum theory to describe this process of heating, not for point particles, for more very tiny particles, but actually for particles of any size. Yeah? And then you can, basically, these are the two fundamental processes that happens from a QED point of view. You have a photon that comes and scatters by emitting a phonon, or a photon comes and a phonon is absorbed to emit a higher photon. These are the Stokes anti Stokes processes. And actually, in this paper, after many years of work, we, we developed how to analyze all these things for a particle of any size, the electric particle of, of any size, going beyond, beyond a point dipole. And this is something very well understood. And in high vacuum, this is by far the dominating source of decoherence. As soon as you have a laser on impinging onto the particle, this creates the most the strongest source of decoherence. Second one that is relevant is, of course, as I said before, any the scattering of a gas molecule. As soon as a gas molecule collision suffers a collision with a particle, it immediately 
tells you where the particle is, because the de Broglie wavelength of a gas molecule is pretty small. At room temperature is around 0.1 nanometers, so it can really resolve very well the position. So basically, uh, what we want is to, to uh, de uh, oh, minimize the number of gas collisions, and you can estimate what is the time scale to suffer a gas collision. This is this, this time scale here, just a factor. It depends on the mass of the gas, the temperature of the gas, the pressure, and the radius of your object. And if you plot this as a function of, of pressure, for, for instance, a sphere of, of typical size, 75 nanometers at room temperature, then you see that you suffer a gas collision at this time scale depending on the pressure. So we would operate at 10 to the minus 6 millibars. We have collisions every microsecond. Whereas if we go at high vacuum, ultra high vacuum, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11 millibars, we have a, around, yeah, from one to 10 milliseconds available. So, and for us, it's gonna be relevant that we don't want to scatter any gas molecule. So therefore, experiments will have to be fast, as I will mention. But this is something very relevant for experiments. So you, you want to avoid any gas collision during the ex experimental run. Third one, as I said before, the center of mass is really cold, but the object is pretty hot. And if it's hot, it emits thermal radiation. Good thing is these photons that you thermally emit, they are pretty long in wavelength. They are for silica around 10 micrometers. So every photon provides little information about the position. So you can still emit many, but it provides a decoherence rate that you have to account for. That's something we understand pretty well. Actually, this heating rate uh, that I showed before scales with the Bose-Einstein Bose uh, occupation with the temperature and the imaginary part of the polarizability. So this rate depends very strongly on the imaginary part of the electric constant for these silica particles. And typically when you look at this, this scales as a, as a sixth power of the internal temperature. So that means that it's, it's convenient to also control very well the internal temperature because if you increase a factor of 10 by internal temperature, you increase six orders of magnitude in decoherence. Okay, so you have to be very careful about the internal temperature. And uh, also, if you have particle in a potential and you do protocols with potentials, these potentials are never perfect. They are always fluctuating because either the whole lap is vibrating because the sources that generate the potentials are vibrating and so on. So there are always fluctuations. And we, this is something we always characterize. So for instance, if you have a standard Hamiltonian, kinetic energy plus potential, you should remember that the potential is actually stochastic. So what will happen is both its amplitude will fluctuate and also the origin of the potential will also fluctuate, okay? And this, for instance, sometimes leads to what is called parametric uh, uh, um, uh, noise and, and, and so on. So, so, yeah, and this is something one needs to characterize. Now, now we do take care of these things. And last but not least, also there could be any other fluctuating force acting into the particle. There can be some stray fields coming from surface nearby, anything that will generate a stochastic force into the particle, and one should also account for these things. And there could be more things. So messages, of course, one needs to be very careful when one thinks about how to prepare macroscopic quantum superpositions, one needs to understand this uh, pretty well, okay? And to some extent, uh, we know how to model these things up to the information we have from coming from current experiments, but still it's very relevant to us to have more experiments that provide us with more information about the noise that there are in the experiments, okay? But this is something we, we take into account. So therefore, as you see, what is needed to prepare uh, these large superposition states? What, I mean, one can conclude that needs basically four things. So the first thing is you need fast experimental runs, okay? And this is already challenging. We want to basically prevent the collision of any gas molecule. So therefore, as I said before, if we want to expand the wave function by five orders of magnitude, we have to do this faster than one to 10 milliseconds. Otherwise, for sure, you cannot do it. Okay, so this already poses quite a challenge to design protocols. Protocols have to be fast. <laughs> Second one is you have to be very careful with the use of laser light. You don't want to uh, use laser light while the particle is expanding uh, these many orders of magnitude because it decoheres. So all the expansion process and uh, state manipulation should be done in the dark. Okay, so you can use laser light to trap initially and cool, 
maybe use laser light to measure finally, but in between, this expansion should be done in the dark. That already poses a challenge. Third, uh, the third one I didn't mention too much, but maybe you wondered that when we expand the wave function by so many orders of magnitude, how do we prove that this expansion is quantum and not classical? Okay. It's of course a, a fair question. And the answer is, for instance, in the double slit. Uh, how, a, a nice way to understand the double slit experiment is that first there is the expansion of the wave packet, and then when there are the two slits, that's where you demonstrate, demonstrate that the expansion was a quantum. Because when you pass through the double slit, you prepare the superposition, and then you see some fringes. Okay? So, and for us, introducing nonlinearities in the problem, which is, for more theoretical terms, introducing some non Gaussian operations, is a way to certify that our delocalized state is really quantum. Okay? And the best thing for that is always to generate some non Gaussian state. And the key feature of a non Gaussian state is that it has some interference pattern. Okay? And that's what is happening in the double slit. Actually, you prepare a Gaussian state. And then the double slit is a non-Gaussian operation that prepares a non-Gaussian state, and so on. Okay? So we need to introduce some non-linearities, which also poses a challenge, to uh, certify that the, the delocalization is quantum. And the last thing is that, of course, uh, any quantum experiment requires to obtain a lot of statistics. So that means that you need to repeat the experiment many times, very fast and under the same uh, conditions, okay? So, so you want uh, the experiment to be repeatable, so that means that whenever you do an experiment, you get basically, you have the same conditions. If it, ideally, you want it to be accurate, but if it's not accurate, but, uh, but at least it's always the same, it's fine, because you will get that maybe the, your fringes are s s shifted, and that's fine. But you do want that it's accurate. And this, for instance, is, is actually very challenging. Uh, Matter wave interferometry in the past, you just throw an atom and all the atoms are the same. Yeah? With the nanoparticles, every nanoparticle is different. So, for instance, you want to recycle and use always the same particle. Moreover, if you need to do 10,000 experimental runs, you don't want that this takes two days because any experiment has drifts, low frequency noises, and so on. So you would like that the 10,000 experimental runs occur really, really fast, maybe in one second. Yeah? So all of this has to be taken into account. So yeah, clearly this is also challenging. Yeah? And, um, and, this, and, and once you are aware of this, then you can start to exclude many ideas. Because many ideas that you by, would have on how to prepare superpositions, microscopic superposition states of many particles, you can start to exclude them. And of course, like in science, when you exclude a lot of ideas, then what is left is typically not so, at least, uh, um, yeah, not a good idea, but at least the, the least bad idea. And after many years of excluding many ideas, then we come out with a, with a proposal. That, that's what I, I want to explain to you, how we think uh, there is a way to achieve this. And uh, yeah, and that's what I'm going to tell you now. So it's a proposal on how to prepare these microscopic superpositions. OK, so of course, this is something actually we, we have worked for, for quite a long time. And very recently, we put the, the proposal now in the archive. There are more. Uh, ongoing long, long papers where we show more details. And of course, that's a long story, so I will just try to flash out the key, the key aspects. Okay? So the first thing is, yeah, so we want to exploit the quantum dynamics in a double well potential, but this double well potential is going to be white. Okay? Very, very large. So this is the schematic picture. So first of all, here you have the particle that is initially trapped and cooled in a harmonic potential. It could be an optical tweezers. OK, and just to introduce some notation, this is just a normal harmonic oscillation or uh, potential with a trap frequency capital omega. And we introduce this parameter xs, which is how much is shifted from the top. Yeah? And then we have the double well potential that you can always model in this nice uh, minus x squared plus x to the fourth term. And here we just need two parameters, this frequency scale small omega, which is the frequency of this parabolic part here and the capital D, which is the distance from the top to the first minimum. And look that it's a double well, but actually I only look at one part. Okay? Because what is important is that the parameter regime we are interested in is in, in what we call a white potential, namely a potential in which this distance is very, very much larger than the zero-point motion, which makes sense. 
because as I said before, the zero point motion is 10 to the minus 12 meters. So you cannot think about a double well that has a, a length scale of 10 to the minus 12 meters, right? So any physical double well that we can create will have maybe half a micron or a few microns. So it will be much, much larger than the zero point motion. Okay? This also means that the physics we are going to discuss now are not the physics you might have seen of a particle in a double well where the particle starts to tunnel and so on. There is, of course, no tunneling at all. The wave function here is extremely small compared to the, the distance between the two wells, so no way the particle can tunnel, unfortunately. But, uh, but we are going to study now the dynamics here. And the second one is that this initial trap frequency is much larger than that one, which also makes sense because uh, the higher trap frequencies are the ones used for cooling. So any other potential has always lower frequencies. Okay? So that's the concept of a wide double well potential. So the protocol consists in the following. Now, we just switch off the harmonic trap. This could be done if you have an optical trap by just switching off the optical trap, turning off the optical trap, and then the particle fills this weak, uh, broad double well potential. So a bit intuitively, what happens? Well, classically, the particle now goes to the right. Okay, so we'll start to move to the right. And actually, if you now look at the, what, hap what, the potential, what is the potential that the particle sees here, the particle sees an inverted potential. And maybe this sounds trivial, but you have to think a bit that a particle in an inverted potential, its wave function actually expo expands exponentially in time, exponentially fast in time. A particle in free space, as you all know, the wave packet grows linearly in time, uh, the size of the wave packet, but in an inverted, it's actually exponential. It gets squeezed very, very efficiently. And that's good for us. So it gets squeezed. And then it, it, it bounces off this part here. And this part, what is it? This is a quartic potential. And you know from quantum mechanics that you can only prepare non-Gaussian states if your potential is higher than order two. And here you see a quartic wall. So basically, the particle bond bounces off. And you might remember from the bouncing off of a particle in a well or so that there are always fringes that are prepared. Okay, that's, that's good for us too. And then, moreover, uh, the particle will return here, will return back to, the, to this point where you can switch on the trap again, cool, and repeat. Okay, so that's, that's why if you connect now with what I said before, it, it fulfills all the conditions. Because the particle, you can, the experimental run is then uh, turn off, turn on. Turn off, turn on. Okay? You could repeat this many times. So let me show you this a bit more in detail. So actually, if you look at the classical physics of a particle moving in this double well, this has a classic, this has an analytical solution with horrible Jacobi uh, functions and so on. And the trajectory, it, it's, it's, it has this avocado shape. Okay? So in harmonic potential, that would be a sphere, a, a circle. But as soon as you have a nonlinear potential, you don't have a circle anymore. And that's what you have, is a Boccaro. That's position in units of d and the momentum. And actually, this potential is so large that if you calculate the mean value of the particle, it follows the classical trajectory. So the mean value, it does follow the classical trajectory. It goes to the right, up to the turning point, and it comes back. Okay? And you can also calculate the time it takes to come back. So that's, and this is, this is here, the turning point is tm, and basically it's given by the frequency, one over the frequency of the double well. Okay, this dependence here is in a log scale, so it just provides a small, small factor. So basically, these run times, these loops, are done at a time scale given by the frequency of the double well. So, which is good, because that's, that's pretty fast. Now, that's re regarding this, uh, the mean value. So what happens with the fluctuations, which is what we are re really interested in. Okay, that, that's more interesting. So now let us look at how the Binger function looks like at these particular points here. Okay, and, and by the way, this, I'm not showing the details, but we actually had to develop some numerical, special numerical tools to calculate these things. And once we found the results, as you will see, they are very intuitive, and we could derive some semi-analytical tools to understand this very well. But I'm not showing this today. So, but okay, so at equal to zero here, we just have a ground state. So that's a Gaussian, a beautiful Gaussian state, uh, uh, like the Japan flag, right? So, so this is uh, position and momentum. So then as soon as the particle starts to evolve, as I said before, as I promised, this starts to get squeezed very, very much because it sees the inverted potential. So the wave function starts to grow exponentially fast. 
and you see this beautiful squeeze state here, uh, and you see the land scale, how it has changed. So momentum is the same. The momentum scale is the same, but the position is three orders of magnitude larger for the parameters that I'm showing here. And then something starts to occur. So if you would have just quadratic dynamics, the only thing you can do is prepare Gaussian states. So you can just squeeze them, and they might start to rotate, and so on. But now, because it starts to feel the nonlinearities, something that happens in phase space when, when the particle experiences some nonlinearity is that these phase space distributions start to bend. They either bend or they break or so on. So what happens here is actually it starts to suffer some bending. So you have you know, this bending. And here, I zoom out. So, but if you would zoom in, you would already see some fringes here in, in momentum. Okay? This is at this point here, which is when the particle is at the, mix, at the minimum of the double well. Then when it keeps progressing in the, in the turning point, you create this beautiful state. Okay? This, we zoom in now to see the fringes very nicely. And this is, this is called actually a boomerang uh, state or a cubic phase state. Okay? This is the state that you obtain if you squeeze an oscillator and you apply a, a cubic uh, operator, uh, e to the x to the 3. Okay? So you create these nice cubic uh, states. Okay? And, uh, and, and as I will mention in a second, this is a state we like a lot. Then when it comes back, it kind of uh, does kind of uh, time inversion. So it's kind of doing, going backwards. Okay? So you just now rotate and then anti-squeeze so that you end up to a state that is almost the, the same one. So it's, a still, it's a still quite small, but actually it's non-Gaussian, which is pretty interesting too. That's a, that's, and that's very similar for those who know about this. It's a quartic state. This is a, like an helix state. That's what you obtain if you apply a, a, a quartic phase operator to a coherent state. And this is pretty nice if you think about it, because what I've achieved now is I had a particle of extremely small zero point motion in harmonic trap. And then I just run a one millisecond protocol, and I end up with a non Gaussian state for the motion in an optical trap. Okay? And this is highly non trivial for these big masses. So, uh, and just to because it's always nice to see a video. Just let me now show you a video of the dynamics. So we will see, oh, the resolution here is not very good, but okay, you will see us, uh, let's see how it looks. Okay, let me plot it. Yeah, but this is how the state evolves as a function of time. It's always normalized to the standard deviation. See, that's the bouncing here again. This is really time scale, so it's a real linear time. So it's really what is happening. Here it seems to slow down a bit, and then you create some more. Yeah, so it really takes two, two TM. Yeah? So it's squeezing a lot. Once the squeeze starts to bend, then it rotates a bit. And, and these rotations are important, because for those that have intuition with being their states, is because here, when it's bounded like that, the fringes are in momentum. Whereas when it's like that, the fringes are in position. So it's a bit like the double slit experiment. In a double slit experiment, when the particle passes through the two slits, the fringes are in momentum. And then you need the free evolution to transfer the momentum fringes into position fringes. This is happening really fast here by just doing a rotation where momentum fringes are mapped to position fringes here. OK? So you can already, yeah, now, now it comes, of course, back to the motivation. OK, yeah, this looks big, but can you quantify this? Yeah? Can you really go to, to what type of scales can you go? OK, the good thing is. As you saw, no, the dynamics, I mean, we didn't know about this. So once we ran the numerics, we saw these beautiful, clean states. And then, of course, you can guess that you can do some semi-analytical treatment of what is going on. And we did. And thanks to that, then you can characterize many things. For instance, it's quite nice that if you now plot the standard deviation, so the standard deviation in position in units of zero point motion during, this is the loop. OK, so it, you know, it goes up, it expands a lot, then it compresses here at the turning point. Then it expands again, and then it compresses back at the end. Okay, this is really this is the Boccaro dynamics. Okay, and you see that the standard deviation basically goes to one in units of eta, and eta is this key parameter that we were mentioning before. It telling it's telling us how much you delocalize, and how much um, how much squeezing you do we generate in the dynamics. And this is such a simple formula. It's amazing. It's just the ratio of the tight harmonic trap. Uh, divided by the uh, trap frequency of the double well and the ratio between the, how long the double well is in units of how much you sh it shifted the particle from, from, the, from the beginning. So you can now plug numbers and immediately get 
you know, if you want to expand a factor of 10, so go X, uh, so S, L, M, and so on. So, and just for instance, if you now plug some numbers to some things that could be realistic, so for instance, we always shift the particle, so we, we would align the initial optic uh, harmonic trap just a factor of 10, so 10% uh, the distance of the double well, the length of the double well, then if you change the ratio between the frequencies and the length of the double well, you can go from really XXL, so really squeezing 100 decibels in theory, and, uh, and expanding five orders of magnitude uh, or less. Yeah? And I insist that the time, the experimental run is just given by one over small omega, okay? which is again fast. So that's why uh, this is kind of putting together all what we need. Now the question, of course, is how do we how do we certify that this is quantum? So wh what do we need to measure? And of course there are many options. Uh, one could think about uh, measuring just here again, and then try to do tomography and get that you have prepared this big uh, this negative uh, state. That would be very nice. But perhaps the most beautiful way, in analogy to the double slit experiment, would be of course to measure here and try to observe a position interference pattern, because this is then analogous to the double slit experiment. If you see an interference pattern in the position, then you know that, yeah, the, exp the, you know, the expansion was quantum. So, and, um, and this is something that one could think about doing, and uh, we have, uh, there, are, there are ways that, that one could observe this, and this is something we have characterized, but I can now need to summarize a bit to finish in time. So, and in that context, when we think about measuring the interference pattern, you have to make sure that you account for decoherence, and then we can characterize the visibility. You know, if you take the position probability distribution from this Wigner function, you get actually an IRI function. It's very nice, it comes up here from a cubic phase state, you get an IRI function, with these fringes going to the left and reducing in visibility. And then when you account for decoherence, then you can calculate how much the visibility depends on the amount of decoherence in the experiment. Okay, and this is something we have analyzed very, very carefully. So just a sketch, for instance, things that are relevant for us. So first of all, of course, we make sure that the parameters are such that in ultra high vacuum, in every loop, there is no scattering to a single gas molecule. That's feasible at 10 to the minus 11 millivolts, which is where uh, quantum ex experiments now are, are, are operating. Second one, which for us is, of course, relevant, is thermal emission uh, because uh, the particle is still a bit hot. So while it does the loop, even if the loop is in the dark, it still meets photons. It cools down a bit. But this is something we can account and put some limits, of course. Second one is uh, this double well will be fluctuating. And we can account and calculate and, and provide a bound of, of the type for that visibility and this size, you need fluctuations to be lower than that level. Okay, and this poses very well the challenge for the experimentalist. Um, uh, also, any other fluctuating force that could be in the experiment, such as stray fields and so on. And, and also, for instance, something very important that probably most of you already thought, that you know, this positioning of the, of the harmonic potential with respect to the double well should be very precise, for sure. It has to be very precise, and we quantify how much. Uh, um, and, um, and, and just also let me tell you one thing, in that context, for instance, one can think about using the other well to put two particles and look at the, at the relative position, because then the relative position is robust to this type of imprecisions. And this is something we also discussed in the paper, but I don't talk about it. And the question is, yeah, so if you want to look a bit at the numbers and so on, then uh, I have to refer you to, to the paper. So there is also the question about how to implement this. I didn't discuss it so far. So, and there are two, two potential uh, ideas for that. So one is to use these hybrid, uh, hybrid schemes, and that's something that has already been implemented. For instance, there was this experiment by the group of Romain Kidan, where they had an optical trap and a pole trap at the same time, such that the pole trap would, would offer a shallow, in that case, harmonic potential, and the optical trap is a, a tighter one, so it creates this optical dimple. This has also been used in AMO. And now the idea would be, okay, the optical potential is used for the tight potential in the protocol, and the electrostatic potential is used for making this large double well. Okay, that would be a, a potential way to implement this. The second one would be 
to actually even increase the size of the particles and go in the dark completely is to use uh, magnetic levitation of superconducting spheres. And there have been these recent experiments now in the group of Marcus Espelmeyer and the group of uh, Bidlef uh, Bicturek in Chalmers, where they levitate uh, micro uh, spheres which are superconducting and they are diamagnetically levitated in a, in a normal uh, magnetic trap. And one could think about designing double wells, magnetic double wells, and try to do these things there. Also with magnetic particles, uh, uh, but that there one has to be a bit careful with Ensho theorem and so on. So this is how, I mean, this is techniques that are being developed now in the lab, okay? So going back to the beginning of the talk, so we had this photo and there was this question whether, you know, this particle having 10 orders more, you know, having a mass 10 orders of magnitude larger than a single atom could be prepared in a, a microscopic superposition state. This is for sure challenging, uh, but I have shown you that using the control that experimentalists have developed, the understanding that we have about the coherence and how to model it, and therefore the design and optimization that we can do of protocols, we're actually pretty excited and optimistic that even though this is really ambitious, that could be uh, done within reach. And of course, this is mainly thanks to the <laughs> experimental collaborators that we are lucky to have. So actually all these people are working on this, <laughs> on trying to achieve this single goal to try to prepare these masses in big superpositions. And um, we have been working already for nearly two years and there is quite a lot of progress and uh, hopefully there will be more progress in the next year. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I leave here a summary slide. <laughs>